welcome back. Today, we shall be reading once more the book of tea and herbs. Chapter 2 Switch now to Bios 2 Gig, our fastest internet ever. Finally cut the cable, switch to Bios 2 Gig. We have to take a side adventure. I turn this off. Yeah, I turn this off. Worst case scenario, I have to do something separate. So let me see. No, I'm not doing that yet. Hmm. It's okay. So I'll find out. Get a little warning just in case. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 Tea History, Culture, and Customs. We have an excerpt from the Minister of Leaves. Who draws the water and boils it? Who spoons with the leaves from the tin and plays oak? Who spoons the leaves from the tin and places them in the pot? Who lifts the kettle and pours? Who waits? Who drinks the tea? Sorry. That seems kind of loud. Let us try this volume. The world of tea. On this page, we have a... I'm gonna call it an insert. It is titled... Top 10 Tea Drinking Nations, 1988-1990, through 1990. Per capita of consumption, the Republic of Ireland says 3.09 kilograms, the United Kingdom says 2.74 sorry, kilograms. Then Turkey says 2.24 kilograms. Qatar says 2.17 kilograms. Iraq says 2.14 kilograms. Hong Kong says 1.82 kilograms. Kuwait says 1.62 kilograms. New Zealand says 1.58 kilograms. Tunisia says 1.47 kilograms. And Egypt says 1.38 kilograms. States that Canada is 26th at 0.5. 5.3 kilograms per capita. The United States, the United States is 28th 
with 0 0.34 kilograms. Figures for China were not available, they state. Then, they state that 1 kilogram equals 2.2 pounds or 440 cups, about and one quarter per day, every day of the year. Let's begin the chapter. Tea is a universal beverage consumed in greater quantity worldwide than any other drink except water. Yet, in no two places does tea mean exactly the same thing. Systems surrounding it resemble each other. Ask for tea in the British Isles and you'll be served a black, robust blend, usually of meals from Ceylon and India. If you take it without milk, you may elicit a raised eyebrow. In China, the same request may well bring you a pot of fine oolong. In Japan, tea means green tea and green tea only. And only in America will you probably be asked, asked iced or hot. Genesis in China, but its exact birth date remains shrouded in myth. Chinese written history is filled with references to tea, which generally date its origin at about 3000 BC. Tea was initially tea was initially considered a medicine gradually evolved into a social beverage and ultimately became the center of a cultural ritual. The Evolution of Tea in China 2737 BC Legendary Accidental Discovery of Tea by Emperor Shen Nong while he is boiling water in his garden, a camellia, a camellia leaf falls from a bush into his pot. Curious, he sips the resulting infusion and declares it has medicinal powers. Earliest recorded references to preparation involve boiling raw, wild grown leaves in water. 12th century BC next written record of tea indicates that tribal heads included tea in their tributary offerings to King Wen, founder of the Zhou Dynasty, Z-H-O-U, 420 to 479 A.D. Song Dynasty. S U N G. Tea is well established as medicine, identified as an aid to digestion and liberator from lethargy. Preparation Raw tea leaves are dried and pounded, compressed into cakes, then broken off into pieces and boiled in water. Results are bitter and unpleasant. Five hundred and fifty nine to five hundred and eighty nine Qin Dynasty. Tea is enjoyed more for its taste than for its effects on health, sometimes flavored with salt and spices. Five hundred and fifty seven to five hundred and eighty nine is sweet. 
Qin Dynasty. Correction. Correction. 589 to 620. Sui Dynasty. S U I. Tea propagation becomes more organized and widespread. Tea introduced via Buddhist monks into, into Japan. Tea bricks emerge as a form of currency used in trade. 620 to 907 Tang Dynasty. T apostrophe A N G. E's first golden age. In 780, the poet Lu Yu writes the book, writes the classic book of tea, an elaborate treatise, treatise, T R E A T I S E, on every conceivable aspect of growing, preparing, and enjoying tea. Spring tea harvest festivals become popular, as does the custom of donating the very best tea to the emperor, the first recorded tea tax. Preparation Tea bricks are made by steaming raw green leaves, pulverizing them, and reconstituting them as cakes, which are easily sold and transported. 960 to 1279 Song Dynasty Tea drinking becomes widespread and is elevated to an art form. Tea rooms and tea houses emerge as social and spiritual gathering places. Special ceramics for tea preparation and tea drinking emerge as northerners become dependent on leaves from the south. They respond by increasing their production of silk leaves as trade goods. Preparation Preparation. Fresh green leaves are dried and powdered, then whipped in a bowl with a whisk. The resulting beverage, bright, green, thick, frothy, and potent, is drunk from a bowl. This style of preparation is still used in the Japanese tea ceremony. Third, 1368 through 1644 Ming Dynasty Ming M-I-N-G Tea manufacture now involves black, green, and oolong types Intense development of special ceramics for tea Wu Y-I-X-I-N-G Ching Clay pottery and famous blue and white designs are introduced. Tea becomes an important trading commodity with countries as far away as Europe. Preparation Round teapots emerge as preferred vessel for making tea, leaves replace powder and bricks for the infusion, small individual cups replace bowls, tea now drunk continuously throughout the day. Again, I apologize. I am totally butchering the word. Yi Qing Teaware. The pottery tradition of Yi Qing in China's Jiangsu province. J I A N G S U. dates back to 2500 BC. The teapots were first made in the 1500s. Potterer. Gong Chun. These small hand molded and unglazed pots made of the region's famous purple clay embody traditional Chinese concepts of beauty and harmony. Their porous interiors absorb a small amount of tea after each infusion, which seasons the pot. It is said that if you use a Yiqing teapot for many years, you can brew tea simply by pouring plain boiling water into it. Look for the chop of the potter on the underside of lid or bottom of pot. Third history and customs. From the early six the 
early 1600s onward, the story of tea in China is inextricably linked with rapid advances in global shipping and exploration, tea became China's most important export. Sorry about that. I must adjust my lighting. Much better. Let's continue. Tea is still bound up with Chinese life and culture. It is served as a beverage, administered as a medicine, and shared as part of a symbolic social ritual. Tea preferences are diverse and regionally specific, with green tea being considerably more popular than black tea. Some varietals of Chinese green tea are produced in such limited quantities that they are rarely, if ever, exported. In Japan. Tea arrived in Japan in the early 8th century, brought by Buddhist monks who found its stimulant properties helpful to the practice of meditation. An old legend tells of an Indian monk, B O D H I D H A R M A, Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma, or Dharma who fell asleep while meditating. To ensure this would never happen again, he cut off his eyelids. A tea bush sprang from the spot where they landed, producing a drink that would forever banish fatigue. Today, the Japanese approach to tea reflects the elaborate ceremonies of the Chinese Song Dynasty, which over time faded in China as they grew in importance in Japan. Tea Ceremony Like no other culture or nation, Japan has elevated the art of preparing and serving tea through a transcendent spiritual philosophy. The Japanese Tea Ceremony spelled C-H-A-N-O-Y-U Shanoyu Shanoyu is a disciplined ritual requiring dedicated study, yet it also celebrates the simple poetry of life and the communion between host and guest. Both eat ceremony as its roots in war. It is said that in the 16th century, military leaders would temporarily leave their weapons and differences outside the tea room in hopes of resolving the conflicts over a steaming bowl of cha. The elaborate customs enforced an atmosphere of civility and restraint. Tea ceremony. Every aspect of the experience is meaningful. The design, the orientation of the tea room, the path leading through a garden to the tea room, the utensils used to create the tea, the tea itself, the manner in which the host presents the tea. There is a striking emphasis on the simple economical use of space and objects. The tea served at the tea ceremony is a bright green powder called matcha, M-A-T-C-H-A. Made from pulverized tea leaves, it is prepared in a bowl by whisking it together with boiling water because what is consumed in the beverage is the leaf itself. A sip of matcha has a relatively high caffeine content. Apologies. I will most likely butcher these. Sen Rikyu R I K Y U Famous 16th century tea master who elevated the Japanese tea ceremony to the way of tea. I will probably butcher this one as well. Kakuzo Okakura K 
K-A-K-U-C-O O-K-A-K-U-R-A Twentieth 20th century philosopher brought to America in the early 1900s by a group of Boston society women fascinated by Japanese culture and aesthetics. Author of The Book of Tea, a brief but inspiring treatise on appreciating the beautiful among the mundane of everyday life. Modern Customs Tea ceremony today is appreciated mostly, mostly as an art performed in special tea houses by experienced practitioners. In daily life, most Japanese people drink their tea infused rather than whipped, but still green, usually bancha, B-A-N-C-H-A, and everyday green tea. It is common for work in a modern office to come to a halt twice a day as the tea cart is rolled through the corridors and tea break commences. Tea in India. Although India is today the greatest producing country in the world, and although wild tea plants are known to grow along the country's northern border, Tea drinking was probably unknown in the subcontinent before the 17th century. Century. Then it was a rich person's drink imported from China and Tibet. The Chinese zealously guarded the secrets of tea cultivation and manufacture. The British, British, the British who thirsted for tea and resented the Chinese monopoly were struggling to cultivate some stolen Chinese tea plants in the Indian colony. They had a lucky break in the 1820s when indigenous tea plants were discovered near the Burmese border. Some seeds from those, some seeds from those plants eventually made their way to the garden of the commission, commissioner of Assam. In the 1830s, the commissioner ordered the dense forest of Assam cleared to make way for tea plants. Despite plagues of dysentery, yellow fever, and malaria, the British persisted in carving tea gardens out of the mosquito infested foothills of Assam and Darjeeling. From there, from these unpromising beginnings, have come some of the world's greatest black teas. Even so, the tea drinking style in native India falls short of a connoisseur's standard. In the streets and villages, tea is commonly served boiled with condensed milk and sugar with cardamom and other spices added to make a grog-like concoction, sometimes called chai. The middle and upper class often drink tea in the British colonial style with milk and sugar. In Ceylon, and that experimentally using plants from India, Ceylon was famous instead for coffee. Then two things happened. A parasite destroyed the island's coffee crop, and Thomas Lipton, the British grocery magnate, came to visit. With land prices bottomed out, Lipton bought four tea plantations and proceeded single-handedly to revolutionize the tea industry, using the salute, using the slogan, direct from the tea garden to the teapot. Lipton made marketing hay out of the lack of a middleman for his product. Four years after his first trip to Ceylon, his plantations and factories employed a thousand people. Today, the highlands of Ceylon are planted with world-class tea as well as much average to good tea, resting for tea bags. The Ceylonese 
themselves drink very little tea. Most of what they produce, they export. One moment, please. Holland Dutch mariners brought tea home from Java in about 1610. Most likely, these first samples were green Japanese tea, which continued to predominate in Europe for more than a century. The Dutch East India Cream. Excuse me, let me start over. The Dutch East India Company quickly monopolized the early tea trade with China and Japan and introduced the leaf as well as the ceramic vessels to prepare it in to other parts of Europe and to colonial America. Russia the first, Russia, the first Russian Tsar to sip a cup of tea did so in 1618 when an ambassador delivered a gift from a Mongol prince. After that happy encounter, tea from China made its way to Russia in camel caravans along the arduous overland route. It remained a luxury available only in the large cities until the 19th century. By then, tea drinking was the height of French chic. Russians were enamored of all things French, and tea a la Francais became popular throughout the empire. The early caravans had a strong influence on Russian tea drinking customs to lessen the weight on the camel's backs the tea leaves were stuffed through cloth sacks rather than heavy wooden chests. During the trek, the leaves absorbed the smoky scents of the evening campfires. This smokiness became a desirable quality in Russian caravan tea. Bulky, fragile ceramic cups and pots could not be transported from China, so the Russians devised the Samovar, S A M O V A R, and an urn, usually silver or bronze, for preparing and serving tea. A pot on top brewed strong tea, which would be diluted from water in the bottom part of the samovar. A fire in the base kept the water boiling. was bitter, so drinkers clenched sugar cubes between their teeth and sipped the tea through it. Sipped the tea through it. Africa. Tea has been drunk in Egypt since at least the 15th, the 15th century. The third variety is black from India or Ceylon, usually in fawning or dust form. It is drunk strong and heavily sweetened and is customarily prepared only by men when it is served to guests. In Morocco, the traditional beverage had always been made from mint leaves alone. In the mid-19th century, British tea, British tea merchants introduced green tea into Morocco. 
where it was enthusiastically blended with the traditional concoction. Moroccan tea, strong, minty, and sugared, is poured in a thin stream from high above the table and served in small glasses accompanied by sweets. Tea is an important cash crop in many countries, countries, countries of East Africa, notably Kenya. The highest quality Kenya trees, Kenya teas, are full-bodied and can rival in quality and character those of Assam, Cameroon, Malawi, M-A-L-A-W-I, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and South Africa also produce tea. All of it black. Some of it very good. Much of it destined for tea bags. Before we move on, there is another insert. Let's see. It is titled The Clipper Ships. America's great contribution to the history of tea after independence from Britain fledgling U.S. merchant marine had begun its own tea trade with China. Tea trade with the China. The sailing ships of the late 18th and early 19th centuries proved maddeningly slow. <laughs> maddeningly slow. A new sailing ship made its debut. Knife-like and concave propel, broad and steep amidships. Broad and steep amidships and its slender stern. The first ship of this design, the Clipper Rainbow, proved so fast that she brought us up back to New York the news of her arrival in Canton, China. She had sailed a round trip in 180 days, faster than any other ship could make the one-way voyage. Within 20 years, the British had clippers of their own, and great races between clipper ships were eagerly followed by newspaper readers on several continents. This golden age of clipper ships came to a dramatic end in the 8th seventies with the advent of the faster and more economical steamships. <laughs> the Americas. You may actually have wow word in phrases. The Americas. Tea may have actually have arrived in New Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Now New York. Before it came to England. Green tea, the only kind available, became a fashionable drink in the colonies. It was sometimes flavored with peach leaves and sugar. By the mid-18th century, the English had supplanted the Dutch. The British East India Company had a monopoly on the tea trade, and tea was the colony's third-ranking import behind textiles and manufactured goods. King George III, finding himself in arrears as a result of, as a result of the French and Indian War, raised the tax the colonists paid on tea. This A N K L E D wrangled, wrangled a number of independence minded colonists. They responded on December 16th night no 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 December 16th 1773 
are dressing up as Mohawk Indians and throwing 340 chests of East India Company tea into Boston Harbor, an event memorialized as the Boston Tea Party. Other tea parties followed and eventually led to the Declaration of Independence and one might add, to a famous national preference for coffee. The Invention of Iced Tea The one form of tea drunk with enthusiasm in the Americas is iced tea. This serendipitous invention was introduced by an Englishman who was running a tea stand at Chicago's Columbian Exposition of 1893. A paralyzing heat wave made fairgoers uninterested in his offerings of hot India tea, so he poured the tea over ice cubes, saved his investment, and changed the tastes of a nation. Until the late 1600s, all tea in England was imported from Holland. That changed when the British, British East India Company, a collective of wealthy British merchants with a royal charter to dominate trade and business by whatever means necessary, persuaded the crown to forbid all Dutch tea imports. Thus began the world's richest and greatest tea monopoly. Coffee houses. By the time tea reached England, coffee imported from yeah. By the time tea reached England, coffee imported from Mexico and Central and South America via Spain was already established as the hot beverage of choice. The East India Company, spotting an opportunity promoted tea as an alternative to thriving coffee houses. There were some 2,000 in London by the early 1700s, whereas coffee had had a reputation as a manly drink drunk only by men. Tea was socially acceptable for both men and women. In 1717, Thomas Twining, who went on to found the tea company that still bears his name, opened the first tea house to men and women. Very soon, tea replaced ale as, an, as the accepted breakfast beverage. As tea became less expensive and more popular, it also attracted controversy. It was widely and colorfully praised, condemned, and misunderstood. On the pro side was Dr. Samuel Johnson, author of the first English dictionary, he called himself a hardened and shameless tea drinker. scarcely time to cool, whose tea, who, no, who with tea amuses the evening, solaces the midnight, and with tea welcomes the morning. On the con side was John Wesley, W-E-S-L-E-Y, the Methodist reformer, who said tea was a waste of money that could better be spent on food. Later, during an illness, Wesley tried tea and became a convert. Into the garden. Tea moved out of the coffee house in the middle of the in the middle of the 18th century, at least in fair weather, and began to be enjoyed outdoors on the tea gardens. London famous tea gardens at Rain Lab, R A 
N E L A G H m e r i l b o n M A R Y L E B O N E and Rahal V A U X H A L L. Fanciful architecture with gardens, flowered walks, and lavish entertainment such as fireworks and concerts. The gardens attracted royalty, nobility, and a central source of social climbers, adding new luster to the teas. Kashi, Kashit, the phenomenon. Ran its course over the next century, and the last tea party, no, and the last tea garden closed in the 1850s, a victim in part to tea's increasingly popular domestic role. British eating habits, heavy breakfast, 8 p.m. supper, not much in between. Anna, Duchess of Bedford, began serving tea, sandwiches, and pastries at 4 o'clock in the 20th century. The important hour became the important, the appointed hour became 5. Within a few years, a formal tea etiquette had been codified, dictating not only the choice of utensil, china or silver, served on fine linens, but also the attire, loose flowing tea gowns, the accompaniments, small sandwiches of cucumber, egg or watercress, scones and berry jam, toasts with cinnamon. Then, and the tea itself, empire grown, India or Ceylon. Opium Wars is the title of our next excerpt. By 1800, with the British drinking nearly 5 billion cups of tea a year, the empire was in financial crisis. The Chinese tea merchants, no tea was yet grown in India, were uninterested in Britain's primary trading good, heavy broadcloth. So the British had to pay silver for tea. To balance the payments, they turned to a product of the Indian colony, the opium poppy. The British East India Company sold the Indian pot opium crop in Calcutta, where it was bought by other British firms that sold it or smuggled it, for it was illegal. Oh, it was illegal in, Ch in China for silver. Arrangement with the British East India Company, the silver simply stayed in Canton, thanked for future tea purchases. The arrangement was tidy for the British, but disastrous for the Chinese. Bill millions of whom became opium addicts in 1839. The Chinese emperor ordered 20,000 chests of opium burned on the beach of Canton. The British responded by declaring war and forcing the legalization of the opium trade. Opium remained a legal item for trade until 1908. The tape bit sized bowl. My mom was doing Ah, yes, back to tea. The tape bit sized portions of these aristocratic aristocratic teas contrasted with the meat tea or 
illogically, IT, served in working class homes. IT was and is a meal consisting of substantial dishes served with tea. It often completely supplanted late night dinner, because after all, had to rise early to keep the wheels of empire turning. British Tea Time Today The pace of modern life has taken its toll on the twice daily tea break. It's a fixture in, in British home and work life. Still, afternoon tea remains a cherished, virtually unshakable ritual, and the visitor who drops in at 4 or 5 o'clock is almost inevitably served a cuppa. When tea is served for children, the ritual is known as nursery tea. Children's tea is usually tempered with a good deal of milk and sugar, or honey. A cream tea refers not to the manner of serving the beverage itself, but the substitution of clotted Devonshire cream, D-E-V-O-N-S-H-I-R-E, for butter on scones and other delicacies. Then, recipe for current scones. It says, I guess it gives some directions first. In the beginning it says, mix the scone dough, cut and place a baking sheet early in the day up to 8 hours ahead. Store loosely covered with a clean towel and bake just before serving time. Mix 1 dozen scones. 2 cups of flour plus flour for dusting. 4 table- oops, I messed up quickly. 4 teaspoons of baking powder, half a teaspoon of salt, half a chilled butter, plus 2 tablespoons of melted butter, 3 quarters of a cup of buttermilk, and lastly, a quarter cup of dried carrots. First, preheat the oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit in a 3 quart bowl, sift together flour, baking powder, and salt. Dice the half cup of butter into half inch cubes and then using two knives or a pastry blender, cut the flour mixture until the mixture resembles small coarse crumbs. Section number two. Make a depression in center of flour butter mixture and gently stir in buttermilk and currants. Mix only until dry ingredients are moistened. Section number three. Lightly dust a work surface with flour. Place dough and pat into one and a half thick rectangle. Cut into squares with a knife. Place on an ungreased baking sheet brushed with melted butter and bake into a light golden brown, about 15 minutes. Serve with butter, honey, or jam, and a hot cup of Darjeeling or a song. Now we have come, wait, let me check the chapter. Ah yes, now we have come to the end of the chapter, where they have the international language of tea, common expressions derived from tea. A nice old cup of tea, British, 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 sorry, a dear person, Shali, C-H-A-L-I, Chinese, literally, tea gift, given to a young woman upon her engagement. By extension, the engagement itself, it no longer consists of tea. I am going to butcher this one. Hok Niet Kien Shanit H-O-C-K-N-I-T-K-E-I-N-C-H-A-I-N-I-K Yiddish Literally, don't bang a kettle. Don't make such a big fuss over it, or don't bother me. Let the tea steep. German. Let sleep. 
Let Sleeping Dogs Lie, Forget It, used in the 1920s. Achai, M-A-C-H-A-I, Russian, literally for the tea. The tip left to a waiter in a restaurant. Not for all the tea in China, not at any price. Not my cup of tea? A person, activity, or thing one dislikes. The British used dish of tea as far back as the 17th century to denote something one enjoyed. Tea leaf, a cockney rhyming slang, a thief. Tea total, T E E T O T T A L. To totally abstain from intoxicating drink, invented in English, no, invented by English, teetotaler Robert Turner in an 1833 speech urging listeners to be tea drinkers totally. Tempest in a teapot, much ado about nothing. The Roman usage, exitare fluctus. E-X-C-I-T-A-R-E-F-L-U-C-T-U-S In sin, L-U-O, to stir up the tempest in a ladle, in a ladle, was already ancient. A storm in a teacup was documented in 1872. That's another cup of tea. British. That's a horse of a different color. That's another story. The price of tea, as in, what's that got to do with the price of tea? Things of real importance. With no tea, Japanese, said of a person who is insusceptible to the serial comic interests of the personal drama. Okakura, the book of tea. Conversely, the person at the mercy of unfettered emotion is said to have too much tea in him. Of our last insert and or excerpt of chapter 2, it says, Throughout the world, there are only two names for tea. Those pronounced E or those pronounced Te, so the T-E-A or T-A-Y, and those pronounced cha or chai, C-H-A or C-H-A-I. Cha is the Cantonese word for tea. It follows the overland routes on which tea was traded and found its way into languages as far flung as Russian, Persian, and Hindi. Tea derives from te in the Amoy dialect spoken in Fujian province, Fujian province, across the strait from Taiwan. The Dutch learned this version and brought it back to Europe. Tea was pronounced te in English until about 1712, and it's still pronounced that way in Ireland. Chapter 3 Tea and Well-Being we open chapter 3 with a excerpt from Equalities of Tea, broadside published in England, copyright 1660, 1660. It is proper both for winter and summer, preserving in perfect health until extreme old age. It maketh the body, it maketh the body active and lusty, it helpeth the headache, giddiness, and heaviness, and heaviness thereof. It removeth the obstructions of the spleen, it taketh away the difficulty of breathing, opening obstructions. It is good against tippitude, distillations, and cleareth the sight. It removeth lassitude, and cleanseth and purifieth acrid humors, and, hot, and the hot liver. It is good against crudities, strengthening the weakness of the ventricle or stomach, causing good appetite and digestion, a 
especially for persons of corpulent body, such as are the great eaters of flesh. It vanquisheth heavy dreams, easeth the frame, and strengtheneth the memory. It prevents and cures. I'm gonna call them aches. It is spelled A G U E S. Surfeits and fevers. It strengtheneth the inward parts and prevents consumption. It is good for colds, dropsies, and scurvies, purging the body by sweat and expellent infection. The constituents of tea. Tea has three principal chemical constituents caffeine, polyphenols, and essential oils, also called aromatic or volatile oils. Caffeine. Oh. Caffeine is what accounts for tea's reputation as a banisher of fatigue and lifter of spirits. Of spirits. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant. It also promotes blood circuit, blood circulation and stimulates the kidneys to produce more urine. When caffeine was first extracted from tea leaves in 1827, it was believed to be a substance distinct from the caffeine in coffee. It was given the name T-H-E-I-N-E. It is now known that they are one and the same. All tea, all types of tea, black, green, and oolong, contain some caffeine, although the amount of varies from type to type. We have an excerpt from the Minister of Leaves. What we call caffeine is a certain form of energy inherent in the leaf and released in the tea. This, no, the particular quality of energy is particular to the leaf. No two leaves are alike. Caffeine and tea. The five considerations. One. The longer the tea leaves have fermented during manufacture, the greater the caffeine content. Green tea, which is unfermented, has one third the caffeine per cup as black tea, which is fully fermented. Oolong is semi-fermented and has about half as much caffeine as black tea. 2. The shorter the brewing time, the less caffeine ends up in the cup. A 4-minute infusion of black tea will produce 40 to 100 milligrams of caffeine. A 3-minute infusion, only about 20 to 40 milligrams. We have a insert. Decaffeinated coffee appears to be a misguided mid-20th century notion based on popularity of... Oh. Oh, I read that wrong. Start over. Decaffeinated, decaffeinated tea appears to be a misguided mid-20th century notion based on popularity of decaf coffee. Through completely different processes, coffee beans are decaffeinated in their green, unroasted state, then roasted to bring out their uncharacteristic flavor. Tea leaves must be decaffeinated after fermenting and firing. Result, dull, tasteless tea. Usually remedy, oh, usual remedy, Scenting or flavoring, natural or artificial. Both coffee and tea are usually decaffeinated with ethyl acetate, a natural component of ripe fruits. The non-chemical Swiss water method of decaffeinating coffee beans cannot be applied to processed tea leaves. Decaffeinated tea is not caffeine free. It still, co it still contains about 3% of its original caffeine content. Number, number three. The smaller the leaf, the stronger the extraction of caffeine. 
using comparable amounts and brewing times. The tea bag, no, a tea bag filled with cut leaf or dust will release nearly twice as much caffeine per cup as whole leaf tea. Number four, caffeine's primary effects last about 15 to 45 minutes depending on an individual's sensitivity. Now, last but not least, number five. Scientific studies of caffeine to date have been contradictory. There is no conclusive evidence that caffeine causes or exacerbates any specific illness or medical condition. But another insert. The insert states, caffeine per six ounce Caffeine per six ounce cup in milligrams. Espresso, two ounces. Beads yield 60 to 90 milligrams of caffeine. Drip coffee yields 60 to 180 milligrams of caffeine. Black tea yields 25 to 110 milligrams of caffeine. Oolong tea yields 12 to 55 milligrams of caffeine per six ounce cup. And green tea, last but not least, yields eight to 16 milligrams of caffeine. Then we move on to polyphenols, once incorrectly called tannins, are responsible for tea's pungency and flavor. Together with the essential oils, these substances also play a role in stimulating the digest digestive tract. Polyphenols account for about a third of the salt. So I'm starting this sentence over. Polyphenols account for about a third of the soluble material of the leaves. In the leaves, soluble material in the leaves. Because of a slight chemical resemblance, the polyphenols were one were at one time identified as tannins or tannic acids. Modern chemical analysis has proven the error of this association. When tea leaves are exposed to oxygen during fermentation, some of the polyphenols are affected and some are not. Those that are not affected by oxidation end up producing the color and flavor in tea. Those that remain unoxidized provide tea's astringent, puckery quality. Green tea, which is unoxidized, has the most astringency and conversely, the subtlest color and flavor. Black tea, which undergoes complete fermentation, has the least astringency and deepest color and flavor. Oolong, once again, falls in the middle. Current research reveals that polyphenols increase the number of white blood cells in the body and boost immunity to disease. Inhibits, ab inhibits absorption, absorption of cholesterol in the body. In the words, Inhibits absorption of cholesterol in the digestive tract and seems to inhibit DNA mutation in rats. Next we have essential oils. Essential oils contribute significantly to the fragrance of tea and somewhat to its taste. They accumulate in the leaf as it grows and evaporate during and after manufacture. Exposed to strong heat, they will disappear completely, which is why they are also known as volatiles. Whole leaf tea retains its oils much longer, much longer than crushed leaves, tannins, or tea dust. Along with polyphenols, the essential oils in tea stimulate peristalsis, contractions of the intestinal tract, which aids digestion. We have another insert. It is titled, Green Tea Prevents Lung Cancer. In a study, Dr. Fung Long Chong, American Health Foundation, New York, gave green tea to mice and exposed them to cancer-causing agent NNA. The mice 
Mice develop 12.2 tumors each, those not given T develop 22.5 tumors each. This reveals a possible correlation in humans. Cigarette smokers in Japanese tea-producing district have a lower incidence of lung cancer than other Japanese smokers. Other research shows blue tea inhibits formation of stomach and limit, 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 stomach and liver tumors in mice. There is a footnote that says International Symposium on this Physiological and Formal Wow Symposium on the Physiological and Pharmacological Effects Effects of Camellia Sinensis, New York City, March 3rd through 6th. 1991. Ooh, another one. On the next page, we have what I believe is yes, our last insert for chapter three. It is titled "Fluoride in Tea Fights Cavities." Forget what you've heard about apples and carrots being nature's toothbrushes. The real cavity fighter may be tea. According to the University of California at Berkeley Wellness Letter, tea is naturally rich in fluoride, the mineral often added to municipal water supplies to, to prevent tooth decay. Most teas sold in the U.S. have 1.32 to 4.18 parts per million of fluoride compared to 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million and fluoridated water, and they may have much more green gunpowder. Oh, and they much have, and they may have much more. Green gunpowder tea may have as much as 150 parts per million. Summary of Health Benefits of Tea gathered primarily from recent medical research conducted in China and the United States. <laughs> Digestion Essential oils and polyphenols Essential oils and polyphenols aid digestion by stimulating peristalsis and the production of digestive juices. Cardiovascular system. Intriguing evidence that pu'er, a black tea, long famous for its medicinal qualities reduces blood triglycerides and cholesterol, lowering the incidence of heart attacks. Tea. All teas, but green teas in particular, contain fluoride, a mineral that prevents the, develop the development of bacterial plaque leading to tooth decay. Cancer. Polyphenols in green tea have recently been identified as antioxidants and shown to reduce the incidence of skin, lung, liver, and stomach cancers in laboratory animals. Research is preliminary but promising. And vitamins. Some studies show green tea contains significant amounts of vitamin C. Tea also contains small amounts of other vitamins and minerals, such as potassium. Calories. Only four per cup of tea. System. Increases alertness, reduces fatigue, and improves concentration. Please, remedy teas. No, 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 no. Book remedies and attributes. Believed in some cultures to promote longevity. Used in various places as an antibacterial agent. Moist leaves used as soothing salves for insect bites and sunburns, as drying agents for fungal infections, and as refreshers for tired eyes. Now we move on to chapter 4, A Guide to the Leaves. We start with an insert from the Ministry, Ministry, from the Ministry of Progress. Each varietal of tea usually has several, several grades of excellence. These descriptions and tasting notes apply to the finest grades available to our republic. Some extremely rare, special grade Chinese teas never leave China. Higher quality teas lack bitterness even after being infused for 4 minutes or longer. This advantage carries a price. 
Special rate teas often cost as much as 50 times the price of fourth grade teas, the most common rate found in the United States. Please note too, that because tea is a natural product, even the highest grades are subject to variations in taste depending on weather, soil conditions, elevation, and freshness. Black Tea Varietals Assam, India a Robust, malty tea with a dark liquor grown in low-lying Assam region of northeastern India. Often mixed into breakfast blends, has a heavy character well suited to addition of a little milk. Finer grades are identified by the presence of golden tips indicating young, desirable leaves. Noteworthy Assam gardens include I apologize Thora T-H-O-W-R-A Numaliger M-U-M-A-L-I-G-H-U-R Paneri Butichang B-O-O-T-E-A-C-H-A-N-G and Nudwa N-U-D-W-A Recognized for varietals produced according to the orthodox method. Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, can denote any tea harvested on the island from a low grown leaf cultivated in quantity, cultivated for quantity, to a spectacular high grown tea with a very black leaf that yields a rich golden infusion, lighter and mellower in character and song, and not as flowery as Dashi. Trees grown in the UVA district between 4,000 and 6,000 feet on the eastern slopes of the island's central mountains are acclaimed for their special mellows. Other important, other important districts include Dimbula, D-I-M-B-U-L-A, and Nuwara, N-U-W-A-R-A of which produce teas that lend themselves nicely to blending with fruits and essential oils. <laughs> Darjeeling, India Very fine and rare small leaf variety from the Darjeeling region and the Himalayan foothills of northern India. Noted for its clarity, light but flavorful cup, and complex characteristics, Darjeeling leaves are intentionally broken during manufacturing. So you really see poor leaf, even in the orthodox method Darjeeling. The closely planted Darjeeling gardens roll for acres up the mountain sides from 3,000 to 6,000 feet. The higher the elevation, the lighter and more flowery the tea. Darjeeling means land of the thunderbolt. Leaves produced at different elevations in the same garden often taste distinctly different. Darjeeling's are sometimes identified and sold by a state. Such as Glenburn, Bloomfield, Namwing, or Castleton. And by flush, first flush is in April, May, which means it will taste light and flowery. The second blush, which is May through June, which tend leads to fruitier and smoother flavor. And autumnal, which is for the larger leaved and it tastes rounder in flavor. Exact timing of the flush depends on when the monsoon rains fall. The Darjeeling aroma is sometimes compared to that of muscat grapes. Because of their scarcity, Darjeeling teas are only rarely sold unblended. Most store-bought blends include as many as 25 teas from different sources, with perhaps only 50% coming from Darjeeling. Kimin, China. Spelled K-E-E-N-U-N. The most 
celebrated China black tea grown in Anhui, Anhui, A-N-H-W-E-I, Providence in East Central China. Fine cumin has a small, slender, tightly curled, very black colored leaf and is unique among these in that it gains rather than loses character aids. Age. Age. Its fragrance and sometimes is sometimes compared to roses or orchids. Also has notes reminiscent of beef chocolate. The infusion is sweet, a tad smoky, and well body. Enjoy as a breakfast tea. The absolute finest grade of tea, which is not necessarily produced each year because of seasonal variations, is known as Hao Ya. H A O Y A. Now we have an insert that is titled Recipe for Tea Eggs. Hot boil a dozen eggs in enough plain water to cover them. Crack the shells lightly and put the teas back in the water. Add one tablespoon tea, one teaspoon salt, one chicken bouillon cube, one tablespoon soy sauce, and two whole star anise. Simmer for at least half an hour. Cool and stir. Lap Sang Shu Song, China. Smoky aroma obtained by withering and drying the leaves over pine fires. Su songs are grown in China's Fujian province. They yield a dark red infusion that goes especially well with savory dishes. Nilgiri, Southern India, a Tamil word for blue mountains, referring to the hilly region at the southernmost tip of India, close to Ceylon. As geography might suggest, high grown nilgiris combine the flavor of Ceylon teas with the body of India teas. Clean, well balanced, and slightly lemony. Rare, China. An entire class of large leafed teas from Yunnan province in southwestern China. The more than 100 Pu'er teas include black, green, oolong, and brick varieties. All share a folkloric reputation for medicinal value, prized for health benefits, not necessarily taste. Indigestion and diarrhea are two of the maladies Pu'er has purported to cure. Earthy in flavor to enhance the taste, Pu'er is sometimes blended with other teas and flowers such as chrysanthemum. Yunnan, China. Tea grown in the Mount Boat. Tea grown in a mountainous Chinese province since ancient times. Yunnan black is shipped along with its golden buds and produces a golden liqueur and is a rich but subtle flavor. Aroma is deep and dark yet retains a floral undertone, often used in scented tea blends and is a base for fine iced teas. breakfast. A name created by tea marketers to describe Britain's popular morning blend. Originally indicated by a deep rich of, nope, a deep rich mix of cumin black teas and any China black tea later. After the English started growing tea in India and Ceylon, a small leafed blend of Ceylon and India teas. Today, the term may apply to any combination of the above as long as it yields a tea with characteristic medium body and brisk character, usually drunk with milk. Irish Breakfast Another marketer's name, more complex, pungent, and substantial than English breakfast, thanks to the predominance of Assam leaves among other Indian trees. Russian caravan. 
Likely to be any of a number. Nope. Likely to be any of a number of haughty blends in China and Formosa. Oolongs to unspecified blacks. That song Shu Shang is often included for its smoky flavor. All Russian caravan teas have is a striking aroma supposedly imparted by campfires and camels. Flavored and scented teas. Earl Grey. China Black or Darjeeling Tea, scented with oil of bergamot, extracted from a small citrus fruit grown in the Mediterranean region. Many grades of bergamot oil, some natural, some synthetic. A fine earl grey balances and integrates a natural orangey flavor. Tea taste without overwhelming it. Attributed probably apocryphally to the British the British Royal Grey, who visited China in 1830. Jasmine. The jasmine plant was brought to China from Persia before the 3rd century AD, and the intoxicatingly fragrant flowers made their first appearance in tea around the 5th, the 5th century. The night blooming flowers are picked in the morning and kept in a cool place till nightfall. As if they are about to open, they are piled next to heat. Apply next. Excuse me. Apply it next to heat. And apply it next to heat dried green tea leaves which absorb the jasmine fragrance. This process is repeated two or three times for ordinary grades of tea, and up to seven very rare and expensive special grades known as Zin Hao. The finest pure jasmine teas have a very clean, balanced, and delicate taste. Some jasmine teas are artificially scented with extracts and oils. They have a floral character but lack subtlety. The presence of flowers in the loose tea has no bearings on the quality of the tea. Some excellent jasmine teas have no blossoms at all. Medicine has it that jasmine tea will use diarrhea. Scented black teas blended with fruit. For centuries, fruit trees have been planted in tea gardens to shade the grown tea to shade the grown tea bushes. Nature provided the suggestion of combining the two. When breezes blew, the fragrant flowers drifted over the tea leaves and dusted them with pollen petals. In Assam, India, the indigenous mangoes are used. In China, black tea may be flavored with the juice of, an, of the lychee, a sweet tart fruit native to southern China. Other popular blends of fruits include plums, peaches, and cherries. The leaves used in the finest scented teas are often from Salem and are generally light body and bright cup. Fancy Formosa Uno. Formosa, now Taiwan. The finest and usually most expensive Uno, often costing as much as 10 times more than other top grade teas. Infused leaves are rusty brown and very large. Leaf and bud sets many with desirable silver tips. Can be easily discerned, highly aromatic, completely lacking in astringency. Fine Taiwan grown oolong has the flowery upper register of a top grade Darjeeling, but a rounder full of cup. Its flavor has been compared to chestnut, honey, and peaches. Finer types lack the dark, hardy, heavy character of lesser grades. Wuyi, China. A large category of Chinese oolong teas said to have originated in the Wuyi Mountains along the western border of Fujian Province and exported since the 18th century. Upon immersion, the crinkled leaves become bright green in the centers and slowly turn red around the edges, a sign of their partial fermentation. Like all oolongs, it has leaves much larger than those of other varietals. Tea Quan Yin, Iron Goddess of Mercy, 
China. The most revered of Chinese oolongs, it has tightly twisted shiny dark leaves and a mild taste. It is one of the few teas that can be infused more than once, up to seven times. As low has it, the tea is known for its digestive properties. Green Tea Varietals Gunpowder, China, Formosa Said to have been given its name by a British East India Company agent in China who thought it resembled gunpowder. The Chinese call it Pearl Tea. Each leaf is tightly rolled into a pellet that explodes when infused with boiling water. Fine gunpowder has a yellow-green liqueur and a penetrating, refreshing taste. Formosan gunpowder is notably lighter and sweeter than Chinese. In Morocco, it's used to make mint tea. Haisan, not China. Haisan, China. Not really a varietal, but a type of tea made from wild tea trees in West Central Zhejiang province. Z H E J I A N G. The leaves are thick yellow green and are twisted long and thin when manufactured. The infusion is more full bodied and pungent than most other green teas, also called Yang Hai Sun. H Y S S O. Dragon Well. Long. Jin, Long Jin, China. One of China's most celebrated teas, it has four unique characteristics light green color, lingering mellow taste, expensive earthy aroma, and long flat shape. Longest grades still made completely by hand. Oops, I messed up. Finest grades still made completely by hand and recognized by their bright and shiny, hand-flattened leaf. The tea has a cooling effect. I just apologize. I think we have to end here. I hope all of you have a great morning, evening, afternoon, and night. So I'll see you again next time.